All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is Emmett Shear, the founder of Twitch and previously CEO. He's now taking some time off, I believe, to raise his newborn child. Congratulations. Um, I'm personally, yeah. <laughs> As a previous full-time Twitch streamer, I'm very excited <laughs> for this talk personally. That's actually how Austin hired me to join the Manifold team, was he was a viewer of my Twitch stream. <laughs> so in a way, Manifest is only possible because of you. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, take it away. Yeah. Should I grab one of these mics? Or grab this mic? uh, you can grab this one, actually. All right, so if you're expecting anything about Twitch or details about AI, uh, you're going to be very disappointed. I'm sorry. OK, so this is a talk about the history and future of evidence. Um, and when I say evidence, uh, I am not speaking about like scientific evidence. The beauty of scientific evidence is it's very simple. Uh, someone claims that if you do x, y happens, and you can just go find that out. There's not, it's actually not a very complicated problem. Uh, if they're telling the truth, it should be rededucible from anywhere. Um, that's the whole idea behind scientific evidence. Um, so you know, when Galileo builds the, uh, the uh, proof that uh, acceleration is quadratic and uh, not like Aristotelian acceleration, uh, you don't have to take his word. You can go build a big thing out of wood and see if it works yourself. Um, but historical evidence is what I, sort of what I think of it. Or, uh, interpersonal evidence that a certain thing happened at a certain place at a certain time, the kind of evidence you use in court, that kind of evidence uh, is actually fairly complicated. And uh, that's, that's what I'm here to speak about today. So how do we decide what happened um, is the core question. Our story here begins 1300 BC, 50 miles inland from the Red Sea. Um, Moses comes down. He's got these tablets. Uh, he tells everyone. Uh, what they should do, but after the Big Ten, there's actually a bunch more rules, and two of the rules are uh, these ones: do not spread false reports, do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd, and do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit, um, which is sort of an interesting uh, take in the modern world. It's, you wouldn't seem, think to be warned against favoritism to the poor, but apparently that was their their larger problem. Um, and I think what's interesting here is just the, that this is up in the list of the really, really crucial things you shouldn't do, like not murdering someone. Um, and if you look at sort of the penalties attached, there's, uh, there's an idea here of uh, bearing false witness, like saying something that wasn't true, is just about one of the worst things you can possibly do. And that's because if you sort of go back, um, you have, this, you have this situation where fundamentally adjudicating the truth is about uh, uh, you have a priest or a, or a judge, but you know, usually should have the same thing. And two people come up with their stories, and this guy says, he stole my goat, no I didn't, and then who do you believe? How do you know what happened? Like there's no way to go, there's no really thing to go on other than people's word, and therefore lying about what you saw is just one of the worst things you can do because it, all of the ability to enforce any kind of law or justice disappears. Um, and uh, if you sort of look at what this looks like versus other places in the ancient world, this is actually a pretty distinct take in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, Greece, in like Athens, uh, you have what I would describe as effectively trial by rhetorical combat. Um, and the famous rhetoricians would actually write speeches. You had to represent yourself, but other people would write your speeches for you, sort of deal you arms uh, in this rhetorical combat. And hearsay is totally allowed. There's no rule against hearsay at all. You don't have to have an eyewitness testimony. You can 100% drag in hearsay. You can bring witnesses in to testify for your side, but the other side gets no attempt to cross-examine them. So there's no idea that like of uh, trying to sort of have an objective process of proving the truth via bringing in eyewitnesses and cross-examining them and trying to assess their validity. It's more like, who can make the most compelling uh, crossfire speech? Um, and it's actually very familiar to us today. I feel like this is what happens on Twitter right now, is effectively trial by rhetorical combat. That's how we decide who wins. There's no expectation when someone says something that the other side uh, have some sort of like rule about fairness. Um, so 2,000 years later, and one seven-hour drive to the north, uh, right outside what's now Jordan, uh, we get some more rules. Some more. Uh, this is in Leviticus. Um, sorry, no, De Deuteronomy. Uh, 
a single witness shall not suffice against the person for any crime or any wrong in connection with the offense he has committed. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, both parties of the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he has meant to do to his brother. So if you accuse someone falsely, we will literally punish you with the same level of the crime uh, as, if you, the, uh, as if you had done the crime yourself. I think the, that level of insistence on you, lying about this stuff is a big deal is uh, was interesting, was novel to me when I went digging into this. Like, I didn't actually realize that that was what was advocated for. But it, it, again, it kind of makes sense, right? In a world where your only source of data about what the hell is going on is, well, this guy says and that guy says, uh, then really it is true. Like bearing false witness is like it, you totally destroy what the basis of the society. Um, so another sort of diversion to the side, um, uh, this is DJ, D. Renjie, who is a Tang Dynasty magistrate. Magistrate does not really capture, though, what a Chinese magistrate did in the Tang Dynasty. Um, they, were, they were a judge, they were the jury, they were the detective, they personally employed the police, slash were the police, they were the, they were the system. And in many ways, it's a more rational world um, than the, than the uh, Judeo-Christian w world is. Because if you look at what they're allowed to do, they do cross-examine witnesses. They, they pull in whoever they think they need the data from. And they're like a scientific investigator. They're allowed to use whatever information they think. And if you go read sort of the description of what a good magistrate is to do, a good magistrate is to sort of investigate, pull in all the data, and weigh all the evidence. Um, and what I think is interesting there is that as a result, there's actually a much less developed idea of how do you tell if someone's lying to you or not? The answer is sort of, I don't know, you're a smart magistrate, like go go look, figure it out. You know, you're, you're a smart person. Versus the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is very much like, there are two sides pre presenting and you, the priest, must choose who's telling the truth. And I actually think, and weirdly though, I would like to believe we live in this world, I like to think of myself as being a, a D here. I, I don't think that's reality, I think that actually, when I think about what happens to me in the world now, I'm, I'm much more in the position of the priest than in the position of the magistrate. There's these people on Twitter arguing about stuff. I have no ability to go fly to you know, Ukraine and find out what's actually going on. And I guess I'm gonna have to figure out who am I believing in this situation. So I do, but I think it was worth noting that there is this entirely different approach to thinking about this where it's not about an adversarial uh, argument. It's about just go, go, why don't you go fly to Ukraine and find out? This other actual approach, I think, is this is just more fun. Um, although I don't know, I don't think it really applies to our modern world that much anymore. But it's it's amazing. You have this trial by ordeal uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, this is the trial of the coin. Uh, if you are uh, accused of something, the priest boils a pot of water and puts a, uh, a coin in the bottom, uh, and then they do mass, uh, and then uh, you must reach into the bottom of the uh, thing uh, to prove your innocence. I mean, if you confess, then you don't, have to, you don't have to grab it. But assuming you're willing to, you want to prove your innocence, you reach in, and then three days later, if you have blisters bigger than a coin on your hand, uh, you are guilty, uh, and, and they hang you. What's, what's interesting is, that sounds insane, except there's a really interesting test here. If everybody really believes in the God, right? Everyone really believes God is going to punish you, and that God can intervene and miracles are real. If you're guilty, you won't do it, but if you're innocent, you will. Because if you're innocent, you think God will save you. And the priest can stretch out the mass. And the priest can, wa they're waving the censer over it and sprinkling holy water on it. They can decide to sprinkle rather more holy water or rather less holy water. They can decide to stoke the fire rather hotter or rather not as hot. And actually have a great deal of control over whether or not you just burn your hand a little bit or like actually really burn the shit out of your hand. And so, sort of based on whether the priest believes you or not, but just the fact that you were willing to put your hand in and grab the coin is pretty strong evidence that you, I mean, that's a crazy thing to do, right? You wouldn't do that unless you really thought God was going to step in for you, and why would you do that if you were guilty? And so this actually works surprisingly well if everyone believes God is watching all the time. We do, I don't think there's any real way to reuse this in the modern world, but um, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps after the, the general AI has, has, has risen, but I think then it can just tell us the answer. Maybe it doesn't have to... Uh, you don't have to actually reach into the pot. Um, there's a bunch of other ones of these. Uh, you have to carry a hot iron, or uh, you sit on a balance and have to wait and hope it doesn't snap. Um, the ordeal by the host is something only priests get to do. But you, uh, 
you you eat the the host, which is you know the the, the bread, but it's they had really dry bread like saltines, and so if you're if you have no saliva because you're really nervous because you think God's going to smite you down, you like choke on the the host, um, and so it's a ordeal by cracker, um, uh, which was truly a real way they did it. Okay, anyway, um, so this is where we are today, right? This is still the current modern dynamic. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? We've all seen that, um, and that's really very much still. Uh, we do. We live in the Judeo-Christian tradition, right? This is this is very much still this idea of uh, our courts run on eyewitness testimony for the most part. They run on people saying, "I saw, I did, um, I was there." Things have obviously gotten a little more complex recently. Um, eyewitness testimony is not the only way to get data. Um, we've got this competition. We've got cameras. We've got microphones, um, fingerprints, DNA evidence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you think about it, that kind of evidence isn't doesn't really speak for itself. Oh, here's a photo of a guy lying, having knifed there. Here's, here's a bunch of fingerprints. Well, how do you know where these fingerprints came from? How do you know that they uh, were on a gun? Like, maybe they're just random fingerprints. How do you know anything? Um, and the answer is because some guy comes up and says, I took them, I saw this, I, I got these fingerprints off this gun that I found at the scene. And it's fundamentally sort of an exaggerated uh, version of, um, uh, of eyewitness testimony with sort of a, a plus plus on it. But we now take for granted this idea that evidence other than eyewitness testimony can exist. Because it's true, having a photograph of something is, is a pretty strong piece of evidence uh, about it, or a video, um, that the thing didn't exist before. But of course, we have this problem. So this is the Paris riots. Uh, there was, you got by the Arc de Triomphe, and there's this big fire, and it's really scary. Um, but if you, you know, of course, if you zoom in, perspective matters. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, is that is this is this fire right? Okay, so maybe, maybe the the riots were not actually a big fire. There was just you know, there's somebody like set some stuff on fire on the ground, but like it's hardly the same kind of a thing. Except, uh, nope, you were fooled again. So that's not actually where that that picture from the before. If you line up with Google Street View, th it's the wrong place. That's not the street. This is the other. This is the other street. I, I didn't. This doesn't include the other. Uh, uh, I should include the other photo back again, but if you went back to the other one and you look at it, it's not—it's actually not in the right place. It's almost in the right place. It's like three blocks away, but it's a different fire. So, so maybe it really was like that. Except that when I look at this one, it's like I don't—I don't know if I credibly believe how big that is. Like, I don't really—that photo is a lie. But is this one really real either? Like, who the fuck knows? Do you know? I don't know. Like, none of like how, and like I have this happen to me all the time on the internet, right? Like, this is like this is the normal state of epistemological affairs for people claiming things that are going on. It's like this endless claim and counterclaim about evidence that's kind of shaky to begin with. And who the fuck took this first photo? And in this case, you can find out who, who did it. But like, a lot of the time, it's, I have no idea who that person is. And I don't even know if, increasingly, you know, this is a bigger problem. Um, I don't even know if the photo is, you know, actually was like that. Like, they, they might claim it is, but like, you know, we have, we've had this for quite a while. You can like edit people out of photos. Um, and of course, this process is getting worse. This is a, a famous sort of deep fake from a while ago, um, Jordan Peele making Obama talk about uh, the dangers of AI uh, on a video that's very convincing, actually. Um, and it's getting harder and harder to catch, and this process is accelerating. And so what we're seeing is this: we had this brief moment um, in time where, where it was it was this sort of was good was reasonably good proof. If a photo was, or at least a video was reasonably good proof of things, and even. A good photo was reasonably good proof. It's hard to fake that, and increasingly, that kind of stuff is getting much and less, much less valuable. And like, I get on the internet, and I have to ask, how do I know that any of this is happening? How do I know these people are even real? Like, they could just be bots. Who the fuck knows? And it's just getting worse, right? Like the the idea that you can trust something is it a, a, to be anything like what it appears to be is slowly degrading. So, there is one future that I hear talked about a lot, which is the endless dream of the perfect and corruptible witness. Um, this is Bentham's Panopticon. Um, watch everyone all the time. You know, use, use cryptographically secured cameras and microphones everywhere all the time, constant surveillance, hopefully into some kind of like, you know, AI run, I don't know, like, like sealed system where you have to get warrants to get the data or whatever, but like the solution to, did someone commit a crime is like, well, cool, let's just go look at the video. We have the whole thing, everything on tape all the time. I am, um, I'm not sure that I'm really into this as a, as a future for us. I think there's a, it seems quite dangerous. Um, 
I'm I'm not sure it won't happen anyway. Like we're all we are all carrying these in our pockets all the time. Like we're not that far away. Uh, but this future uh, requires really ubiquitous full coverage because otherwise, even if you cover a lot of stuff, you're gonna have all this missing footage of actually most of the most important questions. And so I don't think it's actually very practical anytime soon. So if we're not gonna have an ultra panopticon, uh, where are we going? Um, and this is where we seem like we actually wound up today. Um, we're back where we started. Um, we are the, uh, the Jewish cyber priests um, on our computers trying to adjudicate these trials with people making claims and counterclaims. And we're back in the question of who do we trust? How do you know who has two eyewitnesses? Um, and actually, I've noticed myself doing this effectively online uh, or when I read it in the news. I'm like, okay, like three people posted independent photos like when, what, on seemingly unrelated accounts. That, so I, that, okay, the, that riot probably did happen, like I, I think. Um, and uh, uh, that seems to be, we, we are, we're back like the, you know, the, the, uh, the goat herding pastoralists having to judge that way, except that we're not a bunch of goat herding pastoralists in a small tribe. You don't have to figure out what's going on in like halfway across the world to have, form, form beliefs about things that you have no real insight into. And we're judging the sides is increasingly difficult. Um, and it's just going to get weirder, right? This is, this blew my mind seeing this this uh, cons particular conspiracy theory. There's this whole conspiracy theory that Fetterman doesn't exist. It's just like a it's a body double or mini body body doubles. Like it's not that Fetterman is lying to you or is like a lizard person. Fetterman isn't a real person. He's just a synthetic like like they just bring in actors in sequence. There is no Fetterman. Um, it's like the Sandy Hook crisis actor thing, but like on steroids because he's like there saying, "What are you guys talking about?" Like I'm, what? <laughs> like it's. <laughs> It's real weird. Uh, he's, I also love that in the modern world, he started selling body double merch at his <laughs> events because that's, of course. Um, <clears throat> and the, if you're not familiar, like they, it does look really different. Like the angle of a, changing the wide angleness of a lens change, makes your face look narrow or wide, um, makes you look fat or skinny. And so it's real. And he's changed his facial hair a lot. So it's actually it's very hard to tell. Like he do, they do look pretty. I understand why people might get a little confused. They do look kind of different. Um, and, uh, and so what do you do about this, right? Um, well, I believe everyone in this room exists. You are all definitely people, at the very least. Um, <clears throat> and some of you, I'm pretty sure I know your name. And I think that I, that's your true identity, and you haven't like lied to me, and, and I have a high, varying levels of degree of certainty about that. And some of you I even trust. Like, if you told me something, I would, uh, I would trust that that was true. Um, so where do we go for this next? And the, the answer to me is some sort of web of trust model. People have been trying this kind of web of trust model for many, many decades. This is not a, uh, a new idea. Um, but the thing that people keep trying in the web of trust model is like an explicitly and automatically delegated trust. Something where I, I declare my account trust this account and then stuff that account does is automatically trusted by me. And I, I think that's a huge mistake. Like when I think about how I actually trust people, it's not that, it's not, it's not a delegatable to a computer easily thing. It's like a, uh, uh, it's got a lot of nuance in it. I trust this person to, I, they wouldn't lie to me that they took the photo in that place, but they might have misinterpreted what was going on around them when they took the photo, or like, I would trust them to trust their friend, but not trust them to decide which friends are trustworthy. Like, there's a lot of la layers of this, and it's all contextual in this domain and not that domain. So, uh, I think you need something that's a little bit more complicated. You need something that's a little bit more like, uh, uh, that gives you more data. And really, not more than me, more data. I don't have to do this really bad. I want the New York Times reporter writing the story to have more data. I want the people who are uh, out there trying to sense make for everyone else to have more of a sense of what's going on, because they get tricked all the time. I mean, which I don't blame them for. I get tricked all the time. And so like, that, that's sort of the solution we have to see. So I, this is my idea. This is my proposal for what we should do. Um, and since I'm a tech person, it's naturally an app. What else would you do? Um, and it's, I think of it as like the Vouch app. It's like, I, I, I took this photo. When you open it, it looks like a camera. Um, and I took this photo. I, I took this video. It happened here. You get to, I get to say, I took this in this place. You know, I, this is what's my location, the timestamp. Um, and let's you declare other things. Like, I, you know, I was sent this by this person. I, I saw this on Twitter from this account. Like, just like facts, raw facts about the world, eyewitness accounts of what's happening. Um, and then on top of that, to declare, I, I, I know this person. I know this person exists. I, like, I've met them in person. I grew up with them. Like, how do you know them? I met them on the internet. I uh, met them at a conference. I grew up with them. Um, and to be able to state these things about other people and about what you've seen, 
in order to uh, build this web you can imagine seeing uh, in the Ukraine, um, or maybe a little bit closer to home, you know, Sandy Hook or something like that, and you see a uh, this person who some people are saying is a crisis actor and some people are saying oh, isn't, and like, oh, I can see like this chain of four people, like I am four hops from this person. I mean, you're, you're probably seven to eight hops from most people on Earth. Um, and if you actually care to dig in, you can probably walk a couple steps of that chain really easily and like talk to a person you know is real, and they say they grew up with someone who says they grew up with this person. Like, suddenly it's like a lot harder to hide whether or not this person is real or not. Um, and I don't know if this would work, but I think the key thought here is I'm not trying to solve the hard problem. Like, was January 6th an inter insurrection or a protest that got a little rowdy? Who the fuck knows? Like, that's a, that is a mean, that, that is a, a question of interpretation and meaning. I am trying to solve the problem of, no, 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 there really was a person who walked through that doorway at that time. That person was not a plant from the FBI. They're a real human. This is their story. Like, just sort of the facts. And people have to decide what that means for themselves. I don't think trying to automatically interpret that is a very good idea right now. Um, but I do think that we can make a big step forward on, on uh, and we need to do this because your ability to sense make is about to go through the fucking floor. Like in, over the next 10 years, it's going to get, mu it's, it's already getting bad and it's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse because we can't even agree on the core facts um, about what, what, what happened there, let alone what it means. You can't even start arguing about what it means until you know what, what happened. So that's, um, that's what I think the future of evidence is. Um, and I think if we don't have something like this, uh, we're all going to be in big trouble. All right, questions? Thank you, Emmett. Um, I guess I'll just walk around and start up here. All right, so um, it seems like something like the New York Times actually sort of serves the same purpose, or like tries to be the vouch app where it's sort of an abstract institution that, that people trust in. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about that. And then I think there's also this question of if you have this kind of mechanical way to establish trust in particular facts, um, to the extent that people do trust it, it does raise the incentive to um, to generate things that are factually true but create a, a misleading narrative. You know, it's like if you, um, you know, Breitbart and the New York Times will both write about local crime stories and they write about very different local crime stories, but they, they generally don't make it up. Like this person did shoot this person. They can they choose which details to omit and which to include and then, you know, which which particular crimes really matter to their audience and which ones don't. So um, how do you think about the like fact, you know, optimizing for the facts are true versus optimizing for the narrative is coherent? I'll take the, the first second part of that first. Um, if the worst problem we have is people cherry picking true facts to argue with each other <clears throat> and arguing and selectively presenting evidence that is of things that actually happened, I will be ecstatic. Like that would be massive success for me because I agree that's always been with us and that's a real problem. And somebody else should go work on solving that um, and like helping people interpret those facts and making meaning out of them more effectively because it's all, we're also bad at that. But what I'm worried about is like at the very least for the past 50, 70 years, mostly people have been doing their talk. They're mostly talking about real stuff that actually happened. But increasingly, it'll become easier and easier to inject into the narrative imaginary things that don't exist at all. Or worse, I actually think it's the, the, it's the possibility of that that is the danger. Mostly people do use true facts because actually you do get caught out when you lie about stuff. But you have these massive waves of people who don't even believe that the underlying facts are true anymore because they can't tell. And that's, I'm really actually trying to help build trust in the true facts more than I am trying to eliminate the bad ones uh, because I think, I think that's the actual problem we're running into is that people, are, there, there's a world where people don't believe anything they read in the media. They, they don't even believe that. They don't even believe that the photo of the guy, it's a crisis actor. That, that person doesn't even exist. You can't even have a conversation at that point. Um, as for like the New York Times, uh, if they did something as complicated, if they actually tracked down a chain from the reporter to the person and like actually verified these people are real and not, you know, I would be feel way more comfortable with the New York Times. It would be great. I would love that for that. I think it's a tool for them, actually. I think it makes them more effective at their job. That's the idea. Um, you're talking about sense making going through the floor. I'm generally... A little bit skeptical of this just because uh, like with deep fakes uh, it's long been 
very possible to do this with you know screenshots of emails and stuff and I think that societally we've we have some kind of immune system or there's like what you were saying about how bad it is to bear false witness there's some kind of feeling that if I really did fabricate this pretend that this was real and got caught that would be a big deal and and so I guess my expectation is that we can do what are all the things we do for screenshots of emails we can adapt those same things for for deep fakes and 100 percent yeah um, which will mean by default, no one trusts anything ever, almost all the time, <laughs> right? That, that's, I, no, but I guess I'm claiming that people do trust screenshots to some, to some uh, kind of reasonable I think degree. If you see a screenshot of an email on the internet, do you, do you trust a screenshot of a bunch of text? Not, I, I don't, not randomly I, on the internet, but, but yeah, like if it's in a New York Times story, then yeah, I guess I kind of believe that. Uh, I think that I think it's I think it's fair that like we have an ability to set people we trust, and, and there are situations where that happens. I think the Fetterman stuff and the and, and the San Diego stuff is a is a harbinger of of it will it's getting worse. It's getting worse because uh, because of this ability to synthesize more evidence and to make it and and to make it more to create a more compelling, more robust lot fantasy story. And I agree with you that the, this I'm trying the, the idea is exactly to empower the existing immune system by giving it more of an ability to uh, to more quickly verify more stories. The New York Times is limited in the stories they can actually cover because there's a bunch of stories where you can't verify the email is real. And we're trying to generate that to be more common more often that you can actually verify stories. Because uh, otherwise, I think, that, I think that window of place where you can do that is just going to shrink. Um, and it's a matter of degree. I agree. It's not a binary thing. It's not like it's going to go where it's going to stop tomorrow. <laughs> So scaling, if you have everyone in the world on this app, it works well and you can do the six to seven degrees of separation thing. Presumably the day after you found it, there will be 10 people on the app. The next month, if everything goes well, there will be a few hundred. Um, do you think that this app is useful enough for 10 people that they will enjoy it and tell their friends and that at each point of the scaling curve, it will continue to have use? Or how do you plan to yeah. solve that problem? Um, so I, I don't necessarily think it is actually. I think that one of the reasons why this doesn't exist is exactly that problem, and I, I don't think I've cracked it. I think the, we're, generally speaking, the way that would the way it would be good is there's some way that like if you wanted to just, uh, I the, my, I think what you do to solve this is you make it a trustworthy camera that like when I take the photo it immediately uploads it and it it does a bunch of checks to make sure sure that it's actually running in an iPhone and pulls the data directly and like that's of course not imperfect. But it is slightly more trustworthy than, than a normal camera. And I think that might be a good enough reason for people to start using it in the first place, sort of as frontline reporters. But honestly, you'd have to experiment. I have no idea. I, have no, I think there's more of an end state that I think we need to get to than it is a, a plan to get there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. So. <clears throat> Um, in a world of ubiquitous deep fakes, um, do you think institutions like the New York Times are much more powerful? Um, do you see um, people tur um, you know, turning away from decentralized attempts at trust making towards larger, more centralized institutions when it's harder to trust the primary uh, sources? I, I think it's unlikely. I think the current trends are probably going to hold um, and that uh, people will continue to lose trust in the larger institutions for a variety of, mostly unrelated to this reasons, um, but that it will also become harder to trust. Like my fear is that you're losing trust in the New York Times and institutions like that because their incentives are wrong and because their meaning making is, the other layer above this is wrong. Uh, and you're losing trust in the random blogger, tweeter person because, because of this. And you're going to wind up in a world where none of the thing, none of the things work particularly well. Like the New York Times doesn't work super well, but also the the distributed system doesn't work. And we're, that's that's the that's more the th thing I think happens rather than like any one thing. I don't think this I don't think this helps anybody. I don't think the underlying trend makes anything more trustworthy. Um, hi. Um, if you have a network of, let's say, less than credible people, or someone is saying something false or concludes something false unintentionally, 
and then is vouched for by other people. Like, what's the ultimate plan to, I guess, figure out if someone is is such a person? That outsource entirely to other people's judgment. But that one of the key things is you can't vouch. The idea is to limit what the vouching can be. Like, I, I, ideally, it says like you can vouch for this person's existence by saying, "I know them. I have known them since this year. I met them in this place." Right? Like, you can vouch for a photo by saying, "I took this photo in this place." But you and so you can lie about that. But like, it's a pretty black and white statement. It's not like a this is a photo of this. This is a you know here's what's happening in this photo. It's like I took this photo with my phone in this place at this time. And you're trying to limit it as much as possible to raw facts that, like, if someone's lying about it, it's, like, less ambiguous. And then hope that, that the meaning layer that, that, that informs and slightly improves our meaning making above it rather than, you know, uh, solving the problem. Hello. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested just in the general question of uh, how to deal with adversarial actors using this app. Uh, and any thoughts you've had on that. Um, if a group of people uh, decide to coordinate on some narrative, maybe they saw a politician like in a shady meeting that didn't happen. Um, uh, I, I can imagine a world where there is some investigators that occasionally go around and try and like actually resolve some truth claims. I can imagine another world where somehow other people are incentivized to uh, give reports on these people. But I, I'm not actually sure exactly how this would happen and how this would maybe affect their reputation going forwards. So I was interested in yeah. any thoughts you had. I don't think this helps that much with stuff where uh, the claim is something like, I saw this person in a dark backroom deal. Like, the people who trust that person are going to believe them. The people who don't trust them aren't going to. It's not, like, publicly verifiable. I'm much more thinking of, like, the Paris riots or, like, uh, the uh, uh, Fetterman. <laughs> it would be cool if, like, Fetterman, like, everyone who's saying Fetterman is a body double or whatever, like, could see, oh, I'm, you're actually four, five steps from Fetterman, and who in this chain of people are you calling a liar when they say they grew up with him? Like, your friend? Your friend's mom? Your friend's mom's cousin? Like, who, which, which of those people in, this, in the hop, hop, hop do you think is starting to lie to you when they say, this is a real person who I actually know who actually exists? And, like, I, I, you'd think, like, does Fetterman exist is, like, kind of a stupid f kind of fact you'd want to verify. Like, really? That's your... But, like, I honestly think those are the kinds of facts that I'm most worried about. Like, base level, we can all agree that, like, that the Black Lives Matter protests slash riots, whatever you want to call them, actually happened. These things happened in these places. Increasingly, no, you can't agree with that. That and... and I, screw backroom deals. That, I, that's even, like, that would be amazing. I would love to get there someday, but, like, I'm worried about verifying, like, this person is real. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I that's it. Currently, sounds to me like it would help a ton. I can still imagine a world where, like, uh, I, I still think it's quite plausible that if you do this, you do get large cliques with differing narratives about things, and it's quite unclear how to like resolve the two. Uh, I agree with that. Thanks. Um, so. My concern would be like, even if you have a lot of like bad actors, that, that still means they're interested in using this, which is then that means it's being used. And my concern is on a prediction market, when I'm correct, I get paid either mm -hmm. in money or in internet points. Um, but what is the incentive for people to spend all the time it would take to list out, I know this person, I know this person. Like that doesn't yeah. seem like a fun thing to do. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the bootstrapping, if of course everyone else was using it, you'd do it. But like until then you wouldn't. Um, I have thought about like, should you have bounties in the system? Like, I, there are places in the world where I would pay to have someone go take some photos and video of what the fuck is happening in in, in this square mile, just like show me, and then I guess I'd have to pay more to like get get them to add the people who know them and trust them and get those people to add the you know, uh, but like that might be worth doing. I don't know. That, that's I think bounties are an interesting idea for like a thing you could add to this. Um, I think uh, if you made it more of an API, perhaps it, what you really do is you just integrate it into Twitter and Reddit and Instagram. And when you're taking a photo, one of your options is to vouch for, I did take this photo in this place. And it just feeds into the web of trust automatically that way. I don't know. It's an interesting, like, uh, this idea is f fully half-baked. Like, I think it's a cool, it's an important end state, but I agree. There's no, the, the pathway in is tricky.
Uh, so it seems like one of the problems getting people on the app and building a network is I don't have to verify that riots are happening that often. Um, but one thing I do constantly is ask my friends for recommendations for doctors or massage therapists or accountants because Yelp is useless. And that process is really inefficient and it can really only get my friends who are on social media. Um, it can't get two or three degrees out, even though I would love to get those recommendations. So if you just had Yelp, but with web of trust and friending, I would definitely pay money for that. Accountant reviews save the world from misinformation. I think that's, a, <laughs> that's actually weirdly plausible. I like that idea a lot, actually, because you're right. I have the same exact problem. Uh, the the same thing degrading like trust in whether the things are happening in the Ukraine is also destroying my ability to understand like uh, which dentist in San Francisco <laughs> should I use and uh, and that's a really interesting thought. I think yeah. I, 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 I worked I like on this a, a bit. tiny bit and we uh, would be happy to talk about it more. It didn't go anywhere. But yeah. So by the way, um, I throw ideas about this out all the time. Like I have, I, have, I have probably eight or nine of these in any given time that I'm like thinking about that somebody should go build. But like I'm not going to go actually build it. But if you're interested in working on this, I have money <laughs> and and some amount of time. Um, and I uh, I would excite, be excited to talk to other people about this. Um, if you use this or a web of trust style, if you know someone who you think would be want to work on this problem. Um. What is the interaction between this and anonymity in a world where this takes off and uh, vouching for a photo or a statement is a necessary condition for people to believe it? Um, does that degrade faith in the next, say, Edward Snowden type? And what are the implications of that? Yes, and it probably should. Um, I actually don't know that that's totally true. I think if, we, if you want to do something anonymously, what you have to do is you have to find someone you trust as the anonymous person and then get them to vouch for, I met this person. I'm not telling you who they are, but I promise they exist, and they told me this. And then you have to decide you trust this that person. Um, but uh, I don't think it makes the problem worse. I think like the reality is increasingly an anonymous reporter who doesn't have someone to vouch for them will be increasingly not credible. Because like, how do they prove that what they're... Like, at the time, the Snowden up is, like, is almost credible just because there's so much data, it would be hard to make it and fake it. But increasingly, that won't be true. Like I could have, you know, GPT five can go like, generate a a new secret CIA dump. It's probably pretty credible at some point. So you're seeing AI is creating and other developments is creating all of these problems with these better deep fakes, hard to differentiate deep fakes. But you haven't talked about how we could use technology and AI to actually be able to tell truth from fiction on a on a more grass systematic scale. Uh, do you just see that as like unable to keep pace? Um, it's possible. I, I think I think that the uh, in the in the arms race, the offense has a decisive advantage on this one. Is like my I guess my underlying intuitive belief. Uh, but uh, but that might not be true. I can I can see the argument the other way. Humans are probably better lie detectors than we are liars on the balance. Uh, not in the short run. Like face to face on any given one off, we're not particularly good at telling who's lying. But like. It's hard to maintain a huge web of lies over like many decades. Like you, you, little bits of data accumulate that sort of eat at the edges of your thing, and you wind up lying about reality in general if you want to keep the lie going. Um, and so I think it's possible that in AI, AI systems, I could imagine AI systems that while you they couldn't tell like are you lying to them about whether you went to the store today just by like looking at your face, they could absolutely look at your data exhaust trail and say like was this a synthetic data? You know, does it? Did they? Did this look plausible? Does this person actually do the thing they said they did? And I, yep, yeah, possible. Um, I think it's just like more farther off maybe than than other people might. I think it requires a quite a good deal of intelligence to do that. And I think we're. I think their AIs are too dumb. <laughs> I sometimes see a rhetorical trick where someone will, you know, present a lie. They'll confirm twelve incidental facts. Uh, but not the the one salacious lie at the center of it, and then morons who aren't paying attention will take will see this has been confirmed. Uh, like if you follow what I'm saying, like uh, any any thought on this? Would would this actually be a problem? This, this is a huge problem, and I guess like my answer is yes, that will absolutely happen over and over again, and this app won't help at all because it's not trying to. That's meaning. What that, that is is like here's twelve facts. Should I make meaning? What the, what do these facts mean? versus here's 12 facts did I just bought did I make 
are those are those real or not? Like um, what I'm imagining is like like a Loch Ness monster photo, and you'll have I vouch I took this at Loch Ness. I vouch I took it in in 1983. I I vouch that that is not a rubber model. I vouch that that is not some sticks. Uh-huh. I vouch that that is a that is an undoctored photograph. And of course, it's like a mannequin or something, right? And then people would say, you know, Vochap has has confirmed the existence of Loch Ness monster. Um, that yeah, that will happen absolutely. Good to know. Hi, Amit. So uh, we we want to vouch for the facts. We want to vouch for the f- people involved with the facts, or or vouching for the facts. How do you vouch for the identity of the person that has the account on Vouchap? Like, isn't just proving the identity of the the user just you know the first problem? They're you know, uh, WorldCoin with the Orb and Proof of Humanity, all these crypto-based uh, projects, plus the cryptography involved in probably proving that the evidence presented was not tempered within the in the process. All these things yeah. isn't that like a a big problem? It's interesting that that is. I've looked for other projects like this. I was like, oh, I'm trying to find someone else who solved this problem already because I don't want to go build anything. That's like a lot of work. Um, and I found a bunch of crypto things trying to do this, where they, it's all about cryptographically verifying with biometrics your identity securely, and then chain of custody, cryptographically secure, tamper-proof camera stuff. And like, this is says, no, no, fuck all that. The whole idea here is that stuff is delicate and fragile. And uh, once you find a little crack in it, it busts the whole thing wide open. This says, the reason you believe that the Emmett Shear account is Emmett Shear is because all of the people who know Emmett Shear on the app say that, yeah, yeah, that's Emmett. I know him. I talked to him in person, and he said it was him. And like, I uh, actually one of the versions of this I, I was proposing, you could only add connections in person. Like, you you have to bump, you know bump your phones or something to like add a connect on the app because like, <clears throat> my fear actually is the is the uh, everyone uh, finds someone uh, some influencer they believe in, and they all like trust, you know Tucker Carlson. You don't even know Tucker Carlson's a real person. You never met him, like. Maybe Tucker Carlson's like Fetterman, and he just has this body double. We just have, it's a role that people like move through over time, and like the ideally, you kind of force the the idea is to push people as much as possible into the world of vouching for things that are like eyewitness, like I saw, I met, I was there, rather than sharing their beliefs about the meaningness of the world and at a broader level. Just push a, a little yeah. bit more, so. Um, If you require people to be, you know, in person in order to create the account or be invited for it, it's not very different from you going to, you know, a government uh, place where you uh, personally generate an identity, right? Uh, a proof of identity, right? Because if before I can take a, fo- uh, a photo to vouch for something that happened, I need to have, have created the app or the account beforehand. Like, I need to be ready for this. So I already need to be a citizen of this You know, kind no, of society. No, you can just download the app, take the photo, and then go to your friend who is on it, on it, and say like, "Hey, will you like like tell them my account's real?" Okay. Like anyone, anyone can vouch for anyone. There's no there's no central authority saying this is really them. United States vouches for this. It's like, Bo, my friend here, it says, "No, no, Emmett's real. I've known him for like 15 years. Like I met him at this place." I'm still trying. I'm trying to like zero in on like which part of the problem that you're trying most to solve. Because part of what I'm and maybe. I'm going to ask a question, but the, the thing I'm trying to get is what you're trying to solve. Because when I think, for instance, like of what you're saying, I'm thinking about, okay, who are the people who say believe that the folks at Sandy Hook were actors? And I'm like, those people are trying really hard to believe something weird. And the idea that those people couldn't, for instance, believe, well, this whole app is a hoax, or couldn't believe that, you know what, my cousin's friend from college, that's actually a hacked account. Someone hacked my cousin's friend from college account, so I'm not going to believe that. The idea that someone would have the capacity to believe that the people at Sandy Hooks are actors, but wouldn't have the capacity to believe that their cousin's friend from college was a hacked account is so doesn't work for me. You can you can click the thing and like leave a comment and like ask that ask that person. And ideally, I mean if you if you actually care about this enough to like believe that not just that one account because there'd be a whole web of them, right? That they were all hacked. Yeah. You could just like ask your cousin, "Hey, can you introduce like can you can you ping your can you give me you know text them for me and like maybe they won't bother yeah. maybe they won't bother but I actually think if you make it easy people will, people will do their own sleuthing work on the internet quite a bit if you make it easy and it only takes one person following the whole chain uh, who was in the conspiracy who everyone's like was was strongly like they're all crisis actors they're all crisis actors being like I 
met these people, they're real. And maybe the first one doesn't matter, but like if four or five of them do it, who are people you again that you trusted, that you knew online, people. People aren't crazy or insane. Even the people who think this cri the crisis, they, they've gone down a weird like rabbit hole pathway, but they're not crazy, insane mutants. They're just like, they've just gotten a, really, a lot of really bad data and they have no particularly good way to get non-horrible data in any kind of reasonable, like, reasonable way. And I guess I'm, I'm an optimist about humans. I think that if we give people the, a relatively straightforward, low effort way to validate the truth, they may actually go do it versus if it takes more than like 13 seconds and I can't do it from my phone, it's probably not gonna happen. And is that the case, so the, I guess to come back to the first thing is like, is that the case that you're most concerned about? Like is the case that you're most concerned about people who are like conspiracy theorists who believe the things that are factually false? Is that the core of it? Um, yeah, I think that's, that. If I, if I had to pick the core thing, it's actually, it's my, it's, I, I realized this when I, the, the, the Paris riots photo, photos, I, I realized like, I was like, how bad were the Paris riots? Was that was it like cars burning everywhere, dystopian end of days? Was it like one block where there was like a trash fire and like actually things weren't that bad? And I was like, I don't have any idea. And there's all this discussion about what that me what it means. I don't even want to get started on what it means. Like, I don't even know if it's happening. And like, I see people talking about the San Francisco in the news who don't live in San Francisco. And I'm like, this discussion is like you're not even grounded in like base level like. These, this is what it looks like on the street here. This is what it looks like on the street. Like, people are are imagining the world. Okay. So it's both for like it's both for the conspiracy theorists, but also for you. Like yeah. it's not okay. It's yeah, I think I think that uh, the conspiracy theorists are worse at it than I am. I think I have pretty good media literacy and know what I I'm pretty good at figuring out what to trust and what not to trust. And even I struggle and have many things where I I wind up in the state of marking it unknown. Like oh, I just don't know what happened to the Paris riots. But like I would like to know. And then there's people who are not as good at it who wind up with a, a very definitive and false idea of what happened. And that's actually even, that's worse and more dangerous, but it, I, I want it to, like I want it, I would be a customer for this. Um, I guess you talked about the, the people who think that Sandy Hook was crisis actors. Um, but do you know anyone personally who's a conspiracy theorist? Because like my brother's a Holocaust denier and I think this would only degrade his trust in the people who are who in the chain who are saying, I have an ancestor who, who died in the Holocaust. Like he clear there's if he Which people one? like that are like I I think I don't think this this would actually solve that problem. I think um. I think that it depends on how seriously people take it and whether the other people are actually engaged or not. But if the person's vouching for oh yeah I I knew someone once, but if it's like, it's someone you know and they're like my. Like, well, now it's been too long. Now, actually, one of the things that I regret about like the Holocaust denial is like, if people were using this in the '40s and you 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 had the like the sort of the history line of it, you'd have a very different kind of like uh, less degraded data. And as things go farther and farther into the past, they are harder and harder to prove. But I think it's very different to abstractly say, "Oh, they're probably lying," than to say like, "Oh, but this no 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 this 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 uh, cousin or whatever." They like they don't exist. That's not true. You're lying about this person's existence, or you're lying about where they lived, or whatever. And like, I think the Holocaust is actually a particularly difficult one because it is long ago, ago enough now that I think it living people can't really vouch for it one way or the other. But it's very different to tell someone like that person you're claiming you went to school with. They don't exist. You're lying to me. Like, if that person is someone you actually know, who your close person you actually tr like. If it was 15 hops out, I would agree. But actually, most things I think are closer than that. And people's emotions are like, I think, people don't want to call their mom a liar. <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're right. It, it's not gonna, it's not a magic wand. Like, the, as things get farther away from you in the web, you, it's much easier to say like, they're just lying or mistaken or whatever, and I'm not gonna think about it too hard. Um, considering that most false facts are probably believed by social bubbles about different faraway social bubbles. How confident are we in the assumption that there are not actually that many ops away? It, it feels like it might be kind of, false facts are mostly believed by extremes as far as how many ops there is. Um, that's possible. I think people have more, more people have more weird beliefs than people realize, uh, including people who are just like, I remember I think my, my friend Paz, whose family lives in uh, Orange County, 
Um, they're normal Orange County Republicans, um, suburbanites, you know, totally. And, and th they have very weird beliefs now from that, that, that they, and, you know, Paz tries to argue with them about, about, the, about them. He's like, I don't, I don't think that's true. Like, I don't think that actually happened, or I think that did happen. And his ability to show them anything, he can show them media articles. What the fuck does that mean from their point of view? And so I, I, I guess you have to, the question is, how much trust do you have in those pockets of people, who I agree are mostly in pockets, that they have at least some friends not in the pocket, and that that will... Molly's brother knows Molly. Right. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. And were you in the whole, can you... And, yeah, yeah, exactly, one hundred percent. And like, the problem is, you you can't say I was there at the Holocaust. I like, I saw it. I did it. And there, therefore, he's not calling you a liar. He's just saying you're being deceived, um, which is the which is the key gap. Do you have any thoughts on how this applies to things that do require interpretation? Like right now, it's concrete events, facts. But when it comes to there's evidence for vaccines, or there's someone who has a side effect from a vaccine, someone else vouches for it. Like, can you build up when you have something that requires evidence and actual interpretation, or does it yeah. only get into concrete details? I, I especially spent a good deal of time thinking about that when I was working on this. Like, and there's a whole section of the presentation that I cut that's sort of trying to grapple with the idea of like this. This is. Um, yeah, this vaccine does or does not have this many side effects or whatever. It's really hard. That's like that is that is like one of like the I think formal hard problems in the universe to solve that. I think there's a step in the right direction that would be helpful, which is that I would really appreciate if someone said, "Hey, this chart. I really did pull this data from the Pew Research Center population data, and it is a graph of this versus that, and I didn't fuck with the." numbers it, it this is this is truly is what i what you know i made the graph myself that's what it looks like that'd be helpful to me because like right now when i see stuff on the internet i'm like oh fuck if i know if this is like real at all but like i think that's only a marginal improvement it that 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 would that helps a little tiny bit but fundamentally i think that problem is just too hard all right that's all the time we have for questions now but uh, thank you so much Emma. <laughs> <laughs>